All right, we're recording, so we're good. Silence. Okay, we lost. Testing one, two, three. Testing one, two, three. Now you're back. Now okay. You're back. Sorry about that. Okay. Got audio now. Uh, uh, please, uh, we apologize for the technical difficulties, but you know we're good now apparently. <laughs> okay. So. Uh, oh, sorry. I muted you. Bye -bye. Oh. As I was saying earlier. I guess to myself, nobody heard us. <laughs> uh, thank you very much for joining us on this WebEx. Um, greatly appreciate those that have been following the series that Jorge has been hosting uh, every month. Um, in today's series, uh, he's going to be um, uh, addressing uh, how to create components in the Eagle Library Editor. Uh, but in this uh, in this series, it's going to be mainly about components that are uh, have multi-gated. Uh, properties and how to ma manipulate them in your schematic. You could put them on a sheet or on multiple sheets. That way you can manipulate the part according to the different functionalities that it may have. Okay? So, but before that, my name is Ed Robledo. I'm part of the support team as well. And uh, Jorge Garcia, he's going to be doing mainly the, the live presentation with Eagle. And before we do that, we wanted to go ahead and, and show you some, uh, uh, some offerings that CATSOFT Computer is able to uh, bring to our users by extending its capabilities by associating with some very well qualified partners. Um, that way, we could address certain areas um, um, that we, there's a lot of um, demand for. So, with no further ado, let me go ahead and you start this. This is going to take a few minutes. So, I'm going to do a basic introduction of Eagle, exactly what it is, um, capabilities using our partners. Uh, a little bit about a uh, third-party tool for uh, building uh, complex components using the Eagle Library Builder uh, by PCB Libraries, um, about simulation as well as signal integrity, and uh, an ECAD to MCAD solution. So um, many of uh, some of you may be kind of new to Eagle, so I just wanted to let you know what Eagle is, uh, what it consists of. Eagle is basically a schematic editor with a board layout editor, which also includes the outer router. In the schematic editor is where you create the, um, the, the logical representation of your design, while on the circuit board module, you're going to be actually working with the physical aspects of your circuit board. And the third and final module is called something called our outer router. The job of the outer router is that it defines a path for the connections on the circuit board which were brought over from the net list that was created in the schematic. In other words, as you bring your parts over to the board layout, they'll have connections, but they won't have a path. The job of the auto router is to provide a cost-effective and efficient path for those components, for those connections. Okay. Now, recently we came out with a new version, um, version 7, actually an update of version 7, um, in which we are able to now import Gerber files, we're able to import and export DXF files, and we did a slight modification to our library editor in which uh, now it has an entire map of, of all of the areas of your schematic as well as the dependencies of each one of the components in the different areas where they stand. Eagle's libraries are divided between schematic symbols, packages, and devices, and this now tabulated system allows you to navigate through the entire content of that library as well. Also, we've included our schematic hierarchy, which makes it a lot easier for a collaborative team of designers to work together, assign themselves the different modules, and be able to put it all together. This makes that a lot more easier. Also, because of collaborative working, sometimes you will have working on a file, a colleague will be working on the same file, and you won't know about it. So whoever saves last, will overwrite the changes by another one. So by now implementing a, a file locking mechanism, now we're able to have some sort of a level of control of this collaborative working as well. 
Now, <clears throat> extending the Eagle capabilities by using some key partners, some qualified key partners. So now we're able to export a file format, which is fully compatible with a uh, Fusion 360 or with SolidWorks or a Libre, whatever mechanical tool you decide to use, now we have a solution for you to export your board in that system. We also have now partnered up with a company which is providing us a, a simulation tool as well as signal integrity directly with the Eagle Schematic Editor. <clears throat> and third and final, we also have um, partnered up with PCB Libraries are now offering a library builder which actually makes um, complex components, very large components, and makes it a lot easier to build as well. Okay. First of all, I'm going to talk about that mechanical tool solution that we're offering now. And we're we, we working directly with Fusion 360, um, which is um, a, um, uh, an application, an, a cloud-based mechanical tool application by Autodesk. And basically, in Eagle, you have a button that now says IDF to 3D. This opens up that interface that you see on the right-hand side, and it allows you to um, save the file in an IDF format, it lets you export it in step file, and in the future, you'll be able to go directly to Fusion 360. If you decide to save the IDF file, that's a 100% compatible file, which you'll be able to upload into your SOLIDWORKS session. Now, if you would like to create a step file of your design, you're going to be clicking on the button that says export the step file, which is this one right here. This is going to bring you to our simplified solutions, cloud-based, um, a cloud-based solution, which is what's going to do is it's, it's going to map your different components that exist on your board. It's going to map it to 3D models or step models. Once the mapping has created, in essence, it normally maps around 30 to 40 percent of your components on your circuit board. The interface is actually pretty simple to use. The components that do not get mapped, you have to map them manually. The library of components available on this cloud-based IDF to 3D solution it has around, around 1,000 to 2,000 uh, 3D models already there. You could tell it which component you wish to use and map it out. You could extend your library of models uh, in your own account if necessary. Once you've mapped out your parts, you just click on the button. As you can see here on the right-hand side, you could download your step file, which is right here, or you could open it up directly in Fusion 360. These options are only going to show up as long as you have a paid subscription to the system. The subscription to this is only $300 for a three-year subscription, and these options will be available. If you'd like to try it out for free, everything will work, including the mapping, but you will only have the option to export it in PDF format, which is this option right here. It works very well, so you'll, allow, it'll, you'll be able to really try it out to make sure it works for you. And then with the subscription, you could download the step file. If you click on Open Fusion 360, and you have Fusion 360 already installed in your system, What's going to occur is that it's going to open up your Fusion 360 session, and it's going to automatically load the board in your Fusion 360. Okay? Now, as you notice, it was basically it's a three-step process. Basically, number one, we started with Eagle. We went to our cloud-based interface. That way we could do the 3D mapping, and then we exported our file directly to Fusion 360. If you have any questions about this, make sure you contact us at support at catsoftusa.com. Now, we're talking a little bit about simulation as well as signal integrity during our agenda. We partner up with a company called Felicitas, which has created a product called PCB Sim. The nice thing of this product is that it works directly with the Eagle Schematic Editor. In other words, you don't have to export your schematic to another application. Okay? So, um, once you, uh, it's working directly with the Eagle Schematic, and it lets you now simulate directly from your Eagle Schematic straight to the application of PCB Sim. That way, you could try out and take measurements and, and do analysis on your design as well. Okay. Um, then, and we also partner up with PCB Libraries to offer up a library builder, which makes creating components extremely simple and very straightforward. You could take the specification sheets of a component, just fill out the information in the library builder interface, and it will output your, uh, your package and script format, which you could go ahead and import it into Eagle. If you have any questions about any of these partners, go ahead and, and uh, 
send me an email to info at catsoftusa.com. That's info at catsoftusa.com. Or give me a call at 954-237-0932, and we'd like to set up maybe a one-to-one meeting. Or if you want some pricing details, just let me know, okay? This takes care of my presentation. I'm going to go ahead, and Jorge is now going to go ahead and take over. That way he goes live with Eagle, and uh, we're going to be working with the libraries as well, okay? Thank you very much, and have a great day. Okay, so I am the presenter now. Let me know if you guys can hear me. Please confirm. Everyone can hear me. Let me go ahead and share my screen with you guys now. Okay, good. Everyone can hear me. Excellent. Let me just answer a quick question that popped here. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. I'm going to share my screen with you guys. If anybody has trouble seeing it, please let me know. Looks like everything is all right for now. So last time, in, in the last first slides, we actually made a very simple transistor. Okay, this is a library that we made last time. It's for the 2N3904. We saw how we can make a simple package by comparing the data sheet. Uh, we made a symbol. And then how we joined everything into a device. We made a description. We made all the connections as defined here. And that was basically the gist of it. From scratch, everything made from nothing to a finished device. So our goal in this one, in this episode of First Flights, is to build upon the basis that we formed last episode. So we won't be building a package from scratch, but instead we're going to be exploring how we can make a multi-gated component. And that's going to be the focus of this webinar. Now the part we've chosen to make for this webinar is very simple. It's the LM1458. Okay, It's essentially just a dual op amp, as you can see here in its data sheet. If you guys want to take a few moments and Google it, feel free. It's the LM1458 originally formed, uh, init initially manufactured by National, now manufactured by TI and others. Okay, as you can see, very simple. It uses an 8-pin package. Now we're going to use the 8-pin dip. We could also bring in other packages if we wanted to as well. Um, but for the purposes of, of this uh, demonstration, we're just going to bring in the 8-pin dip. Okay, our focus is going to be very much on the multi-gated aspect, on the fact that we have two amplifiers that we need to bring into this uh, device. Okay, so without further ado, let's go ahead and start on the first part, which is the symbol. So we're going to continue on the same library that we made last time. Click on the symbol icon. And I'm going to call this symbol just very simply op amp. Okay, create a new symbol op amp. We're going to say yes. Now in the last webinar, we saw again for the symbol the importance of keeping everything to a point one inch grid. If you like the metric system, you can go ahead and change it to metric. It'll be 2.54 millimeters, but you do not want to deviate from this specific spacing uh, on the schematic symbol. Okay, for the package, as we mentioned in the last webinar, you can use whatever is convenient, but for the symbol, we want to go ahead and stick to a 0 0.1 inch grid. Okay, that way everything can connect properly. So for our basic op amp symbol, if we notice in the data sheet, we basically just need the outputs and the two inputs. Okay, for the moment we're going to ignore the power rails, and I'll explain why in a second. Okay, but for the moment we're going to ignore the power rails. We're just going to make an op amp symbol that we can uh, reuse. Very simple, very basic. So we'll go over here. And the first thing I'm going to do is I'm actually going to draw the triangle out. Okay, and, and there's several ways you could do this. I'm going to go ahead and draw it like this. Now, by right-clicking, I can switch to the various bend styles. Okay, and we saw this in the last webinar, but it's good to recap. Here. Okay. There's a very simple triangle. 
Next, we're going to use the pin command to put in the electrical connections. One, two, and three. So far, so good. Now, I'm sure it's very apparent to everyone that this doesn't quite look right. We have this text, and obviously they're poorly named. Uh, right now, they're just using the default that Eagle has, so let's go ahead and rename them. Just so you know, whenever you see a dollar sign in anything in Eagle, it usually is letting you know that it's what Eagle put in as a default. Most people don't use dollar signs by default, so the developers made sure that whenever Eagle assigns a name to anything, there's a dollar sign there to let the user know that it's a default assignment. Um, that, you know, to remind the user that they didn't set up a specific name for that part. So for the pin, we're going to go over here. Let's call this one our non-inverting. And we'll call this one our inverting. And we'll call this out. Okay. Now, uh, it's still not very nice, as you can see, because just of the way things are oriented, it doesn't quite look clean. Uh, the bad news with this is that you can't move these around. These, the, the way these texts are generated, they're, they're not movable. So the trick here, or the workaround for this, is as follows. We're going to go ahead and use the Change uh, Visible option. And we're going to set it so that instead of showing both the pad and the pin, we're going to leave it so it only shows the pad. And this will become important later. So right now, we can't see any of the pin names. So this is just a symbol, and we haven't assigned pad numbers to it yet. We can't see the pad numbers either. Okay. The workaround is we're going to manually add in the text we want. So I'm going to put in a plus sign, say OK. Now everything is still on grid, and that's not too helpful for what we want to do right now. So what we can do is we can go to our grid settings, and we can set up the alternate grid. And the alternate grid is useful for situations like this one. I'm going to set it to a quarter of the grid. That's usually good enough for any precision placement. Now, the alternate grid should only be invoked if you're going to do things like this, like place text down, you know, where it's not critical, the connection point. So I'm going to make this minus. Okay, and again, we can kind of locate it where we want it to be. And this is fine for our purposes. And I'm not going to add in an out text. It's not necessary for this. I mean, I'm not quite happy with where this is at. Let me go ahead and move it a little bit more. Leave it there. Stay for the sake of argument for now. Ah, sorry, I get picky. Put that. Okay. Now the only other thing we're missing are the uh, are the name and the value placeholders. So we can produce those very quickly using this UOP I'm going to show you guys now. Click on the UOP icon, which is this one up here. Eagle comes with several of these. Let's just pick the set name and value. Now I type the S to move down quickly to the S section because they're all organized alphabetically. We select set name and value. And now these have been placed. Again, we can left click on the move command to locate them elsewhere. Say I want to put that here. Okay. Very straightforward. Now the only other thing I want to discuss here is the pin directions. So we use the info command. Now, Eagle allows you to assign various directions, and these are only used for ERC checking, for the electrical rules check. Okay? So we have no connect, input only, output only, bidirectional, input output, open collector. Power pins, these are used if, for example, the voltage rails on the chip. Passive is basically no check. High input impedance and the supply. Supplies are only used for supply symbols. They're never used in uh, in association with packages. Okay, so we could do here since this is a voltage feedback op amp, a normal op amp. 
I'm going, I'm going to go ahead and set this as an input. Swap level is basically used to indicate if pins can be swapped, if they're basically equivalent. Um, in the case of the op amp, there's, they all have to be unique here. Okay, and so none of these pins are swappable. The inverting input cannot be swapped with the inverting input. That would be very, very bad. So I'm going to go ahead and set this to in. I'll do the same thing here with this one. And I'll leave this one as an I.O. Okay? reason for that is they can both source and sync current, usually, for the op amp. So I'll leave it at that. When in doubt, just leave it at I.O. It's not subject to any special checks. So that basically completes the symbol. Um, we can add in a simple description down here. I'll just say basic op amp symbol. Say OK. Any questions on the symbol so far? Any any questions you guys have right now? Okay. You can use the align feature to. Yeah, I could check. I could change the text alignment. That's true. Constantine uh, has put up a, an interesting suggestion. That's true. I could play with the alignment to get them to line up a little better. So let's go ahead and show that real quick. In Eagle, you can change the text alignment. For example, for center. Let's do that. Uh, where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Align. Here we go. Let's say center. And what I can do then is using the alt grid, put that there, put that here, and they're pretty much aligned. They're pretty much centered relative to each other. That makes things a little bit cleaner. Okay, so that's that's a that's kind of a minor feature in Eagle, but yeah, it's thank you, Constantine, for bringing it up. And if it's not what you intended, thank you anyway for bringing it up. And the way I access that was change, align, and you can specify what the reference point for the text is, okay, whether it be the center of the text, center right, top left. There's nine points that you can snap from, okay? So any other questions on our, on our symbol or any other suggestions? Okay, so let's move on to the package. Now, like I told you guys, the focus of, of this webinar is to really be able to focus on the multi-gated aspect. So because this is a dual inline 8-pin package, um, I'm not going to create that from scratch. If you guys want to see it from scratch, if you guys want to see it from scratch, check out episode 4 for the basic technique. Okay, and this one what we're going to do is we're going to copy an existing package. So I'm going to go ahead and show you that. I'm going to go over here to libraries. Now, I already know where, what, what package I want to use, but again, from other webinars, you can see how to search for the package you want. So here's our library. The key point for this technique of copying to work is that the library you want to copy into needs to be open. Okay, so I repeat, the destination library needs to be open for this to work. It doesn't have to be visible like it is now. I'm going to have it minimized but it needs to be open and ready for editing. So the package I want, we go down, it's in the RCL, I'm sorry, in the ref packages library, which can be seen here from the control panel. Are you ref packages right here? And when I expand it, this library only contains packages. So if you try to look through it, uh, look for it in the schematic view, it will not show up. The reason for that is that packages cannot be added to a schematic anyway. So it's just an error checking thing. Um, we're going to scroll down, and in Eagle, the dual inline package we list as DIL. Okay, and we're going to pick this one. I'm going to right-click on it. I want to see the option Copy to Library. We left-click that, and here it is in our library. You can see all of the pad names perfectly displayed. Okay, so this package is ready to go. Now, one thing I do urge you, whenever you're, you copy a package, you do want to double check just to make sure everything is in order. So I bring up our data sheet. We go down to page 10. You just want to quickly just confirm that everything is okay. 
Okay, so if we look, pin spacing is 0 0.1 inches. If we look at our library, that's the case here between all the, pa the pads because we have a 0 0.05 grid spacing, so two grid spacings is 0 0.1. So we got perfect separation there. Okay, now we just also want to make sure the separation between the two uh, rows of, of pads is also accurate. So the separation here is set to be 0 0.3 inches, 300 mils. So we compare that to the data sheet, and if we look here, it's 300 mils. Yeah, at a minimum, it's 300 mils. So it, it's OK. That's going to be fine, because when you bend them in, um, obviously, with through whole parts, there's a little bit of wiggle room. So you bend them in, and, 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 and they'll fit just fine. OK, when in doubt, you can always give a little extra, but you'll have to stretch out the pins. So I tend to leave that alone. 0.3, as we can see here. It's OK. So that's basically the key points. That's usually, usually what I'll worry about. You can obviously spend more time checking silk screen. And, and if you want everything perfect, you can do that. For this example, the critical thing to make sure the package will work is just the separation between the, the two rows, OK? And that the pin pitch is accurate as well, OK? So package is taken care of. Now let's go back to symbol for a second. And here's a consideration that I, I want to bring up. In the data sheet, remember that when we drew the symbol, I told you guys not to worry about the power pins. Okay. Now we're going to worry about them. Basically, the way the strategy I'm going to show you to deal with the power pins in this case is to make a symbol that only includes the power pins. Okay, we're going to do that now, and then we're going to discuss the alternative and why this is the recommended approach. Okay, so we're going to go ahead, go back to our library. We're going to create a symbol that we'll call Power P. We can call it pins. We can call it whatever is descriptive. I'll call it Power P for pins. Okay, okay. create new symbol. I'm going to say yes. And all I'm going to do is put in two pins. So this one, so this one. So we'll go ahead and give these names as well. Call this plus V. And I'll call this one minus V. Now, because these are the power rails of this component, we are going to switch the pin direction to be power. Okay, and we can do that with the info command, as we did before. Or we can do that with the change command that's here. It's this little wrench okay, over here. Click on change. And we can go to direction. Then we can go to PWR. Click on PWR for power. And then we can click on a pin. And click on a pin, and you'll see that they automatically become power pins. Okay, the change command is usually a lot faster for making any type of adjustment in your design, um, but a lot of the functionality that it contains can also be achieved through other commands. But often, I'll, I'll stick with change if I can. Okay, now right now, you guys will notice that even though we changed the names, the pin names aren't visible, and that's because we had disabled that previously. So for these, I think it's OK to make both visible. So again, I went to Change, go down to Visible, and I'll select both. So I can see both the pad and the pin. Click on that, click on this, and I think that's pretty good. Once again, we will want to add in the name and value. So UOP, and set name and value. Double click it, and we have it. I'll go ahead and move this over. Now again, these are set to the center because that's what I had changed to previously. The change command is actually whatever changes you make, it does stick. So I'll set the align back to bottom left because for this, it's easier to have them at bottom left. So bottom left, bottom left, over. Now, what's the alternative to doing it this way? Okay, because our package has two, two, uh, two power pin. Uh, sorry, two op amps. Well, some some users what they like to do is that they'll 
actually make two different op amp symbols, one with the power pins and one without. I find that that makes it, number one, is more work because you you have to basically repeat the op amp design with the only difference being two pins. The other issue with that is that if you want to, for example, swap uh, swap op amp gates, you can't do it because n these two gates can't be equivalent because one has five pins, the other one doesn't. And we'll see that now as we go into the device. But that's generally the reason that we recommend that you just keep the power pin separate and allow all of the various, for example, if you have a dual op amp, use the same symbol for both because that's going to allow you to make them swappable. Whereas if you have one, pow uh, one op amp symbol that has the pins and one that doesn't, they are no longer swappable because they, as far as Eagle is concerned, they're not equivalent. One has two extra pins that the other one doesn't have. Okay, so keep that in mind as we now go and make the device for this op amp. So I'll say OK here. We're going to click on the device icon, which is this one up here. Okay, we click on device. And I'm going to call this LM1458. Okay, we're going to say yes. And again here, we have the same window we saw in last episode, okay, of making a basic package. Here we're going to put our in. We're going, here we're going to place our symbols. Here we're going to place our package, and then we have a description for the overall part. So let's bring in the package first, as that's going to be the easiest part to explain here. We're going to click New. I'm going to select the dual inline 08. Say OK. Prefix for this is going to be IC, and then I'm going to leave value off. If value is set to off, then the value of the part is basically the name of the device, which is what we want in this case. We want it to be called the LM1458. If we set it to on, then the default value is empty, and we can set it to whatever what value we want. And this is used when you have passes, resistors, capacitors, inductors, or anything of that nature. OK? Now let's bring in the symbols. So we click here on our symbol icon, and we're going to bring in two of the op-amp symbols. Bring in one, bring in two, and then we're going to bring in one of the power supply symbols. Uh, over here, power pins, and there we are. So as you can see, for this particular device, we have two op amps, identical, and we have the power pins. Okay? So because they are identical, these can be made swappable. So sometimes, for example, in your schematic, you'll assign this gate to be part of a circuit and then the other op amp to be part of another circuit. But when you try to route it out, you discover that it's probably more convenient if you swap the gates. If you had the second gate handle the first part of the circuit and the first gate handle the second part of the circuit. So basically swap them. So that's what we're going to set now. And the way we do this is by going to change and we set swap level. A swap level of zero means the gate is unique, just as it is with pins. Okay? Any value higher than zero, so for example, we're going to choose one in this case, any other gate that has a swap level of one is considered swappable with, any, with all the gates that have a swap level of one. So to reiterate that, any numbers, any, sorry, any gates that have the same number are considered swappable. So, Swap level of one here, swap level of one here. Eagle allows it because there are identical gates. Okay? So remember, zero means it's unique. It cannot be swapped with anything. Any numbers higher than zero indicate swappable. So that any gates that have the same swap level, the same swap number, are swappable amongst themselves. Okay? If there's any questions on that, please send them in right now. Or if you need any clarification, feel free to send them in. Okay. Now, whenever you bring in a gate, you'll notice that it gets a name, G$1, G$2. These will not show up in the, well, actually, the G, G$1 will show up when you put this into a schematic. However, most people don't like that. Usually you'll like A, B, or 1, 2, or something like that. 
So here's what you could do for that. We can go to the name command, and we can call this A, and we can call this B. And what's going to happen is when we bring this into the schematic, let's say this is Here we have a good question here. This is a, a very good question. Does the swapping go across packages? It does not. You can only swap within the same package. So that, that's actually a good clarification. Uh, thank you, Tom. Swapping can only be done within a package. So if we have two of these parts in the, in the design, for example, that gives us a total of four op amps. We cannot swap. For example, op amp one and IC one for op amp two and IC two. We can't do that swap. Swapping can only be done within a package. Okay? So hopefully that answers that question. Okay. Now the other thing I, I want to discuss a little bit here is the add levels. Okay, you'll notice that each of these gates has an add level. By default they're all set to next. And what this means is they're going to come in sequential order, okay? So A, then B, then power, okay? And I'm actually going to change the name of this to P, power, okay? A, B, P. After you place P, it'll start at A again, but now it'll be the second chip. A, B, P, then third chip, A, B, P, so on and so forth for as many as, as you add of these. And that's okay. That's a, that's a good way. Now, there are other options with the add level. As you can see here, must indicates that the part has always has to be in, uh, has to be in the part as long as some other part is always there. Can indicates that you can delete that part separately, for example. Okay, and let me actually show you where that instruction is in the manual so you guys can look it up in the future. So we go over here to the control panel. Let's go into manual English. See it? Going to go into chapter eight. Chapter eight. Symbols. Ad level parameter. Okay? So here's a summary of the different ad level parameters. Next, like I mentioned, goes in sequence. Must. Basically indicates gates that if some other gate is present, this other gate must also be present. And this is useful, for example, in the, in the coil of a relay. If you have the, the, the switches, the contacts of the relay, then the coil must also be present. Gates that are defined as must cannot be deleted unless all the other gates are deleted. Can are for gates that are only used as required. Okay, so again, it gives the example of a relay sum. Uh, relay context may be defined with can. So these can be specifically fetched with the invoke command. Okay, and something a similar behavior can be seen in request, but request is used for something else. Always is for gates that always need to be brought into the design, basically as soon as you fetch the component at all. Okay? Request is always used only for the supply gates, okay, for the power pins. Only used for power pins. The difference from CAN is, as you can see here, is that if a device is exactly one next gate and one request gate, they will be named, for example, I see when the gate name does not appear in the name of the part in the schematic. The request gate's gate name, however, will consist of the prefix plus a number plus a gate name. For example, IC1P, which is what we want to see. In the case of the CAN, you won't see its name. In the case of the request, you will. Okay. For more information, you can see section 8.9 of the Eagle Manual. Let's go ahead and go back to the library. Now, we did have a question here. So if, for example, we have two different types of op amps in symbols, can you reuse the power pin symbol for each op amp type? Yes, you can. Because remember that you really define a part in the device. 
So you can have 20 different op-amp symbols because they have different nulling or different other parameters that you can adjust, you know, the compensation, things like that. But that the same power pin symbol, if they all use just, you know, a standard plus minus voltage rail, then you can use the same power pin for all of those devices and it won't be a problem. Okay, so hopefully that answers the question. If it doesn't, let me know. Anything else here? Okay. Let us continue. So now we're going to make the connections, and you're going to see how this works. So we did A, B. Oh, I forgot. So because these are power pins, I'm going to set this as request, at level request. What this means is that they are not going, the power pins are not going to come in automatically. Okay, and this is kind of a holdover from the origins of digital logic, where to maintain the clarity of the design uh, of the design intent, what a lot of guys would do is they would put the logic gates on one sheet and then all the power stuff on a second sheet. That way, it didn't clutter up the main schematic. Okay, it's still a useful practice today, and by setting it to request, what we're going to see is when we bring this part into a schematic, A then B will come in, and then it's going to start over. A, B, A, B, A, B, A, B. The P will not come in unless we explicitly ask it to be brought in. Okay, I'll show, I'll show how that can be useful and how that can keep cleanliness in the design in a second. Okay? So we have that. Let's go ahead and make the connections. So the connections, I'm just following straight from the data sheet. Oops, it's manual. I'm just going to follow this here. I have a printed version in front of me so I know what pins go where. But basically, just know that we're going as it is here. So as you can see, the A, the B, makes it very clear what's being connected to what. So in one is the output of the A op amp, according to the data sheet. Pin two is the inverting input of the A op amp. Pin 3 is the non-inverting input of the A op amp. Okay. Pin 4 is V minus. Pin 5 is the non-inverting input of the B op amp. Pin 6 is the inverting input of the B op amp. Pin 7 is the output of the B op amp. And pin 8 is the V plus. Okay. Now, if you ever want to, what did I do? I didn't append there. Let me undo that. <laughs> so pin seven is a B output connect, and then pin eight is a V plus. Now, there we basically illustrated that you can assign multiple pads to a single pin by the append. That was accidental. Again, as we mentioned in the last webinar, once you finish with the pin column, you have everything mapped. It's okay to have additional pads. That that isn't uh, a sin. There are many packages out there that have no connect pins that aren't used, so it's okay to have additional pads. Okay, what you can never have extra is pins. Now, if we wanted to verify, like if we have the data sheet, obviously the sequence is inconvenient. You can just sort by pad number. You'll see it'll go in order. And we can just pull out the, let me see if I minimize this, maybe I can show it. Yeah, here we go. So as you can see here, by putting it in order, we can just check A out, inverting input, non-inverting input for A, minus, invert, non-inverting input for B, 5, inverting input for B, output for B, and then the V plus. So that's just a handy way to verify afterwards. I find that, that useful uh, for my workflow, but maybe for you guys it's not. Say OK. And you know, we can put in a simple description here. Dual operational amplifier. Say OK. And we're going to go ahead and click Save. Okay, so I've saved the library. Let's go ahead and use it. So we're going to go File, New, Schematic.
Okay, just so to repeat it because I know it went quickly. File new schematic. So that's schematic. Now before we can use any part we create, we have to put that library in use. So I'm gonna go library use from the desktop, which is where I saved this library. I select the library I want to have in use. This basically tells Eagle that the library is active and available for searching. I'll just double click it to select it and open it. Okay, you'll see that nothing happens. As long as Eagle doesn't complain, that means it worked. Okay. Let's go into the add command. And let's find FF4. Again, I can just click on something and type F to jump straight to it. And here it is, FF4. Fourteen fifty-eight. Here's the part we made. We say OK. And what you guys are going to notice is that here's A, I see one A, I see one B, I see two A, I see two B. So the power pins don't come in. Okay? And that's because we had set them to request. To bring them in, you're going to use this command over here. This is invoke. Okay? Invoke. So we click it. Then we click one of the gates. You'll see that it will show you all of the available gates. The one that we haven't brought in is power pin. So I'll say power pin, say OK. And I can place it. And I can repeat this for the others. There we are. OK? Very, very simple. Now, like I said, by having them separate, you also gain the advantage that you can put them on a separate sheet and maintain the clarity of the design. Let me show you an example with one of my recent projects. Okay, So I'm going to close this. I'm going to say, I'm not going to save it because it's very basic. I'm going to go ahead and show you guys what the recent project that I have here. It's a compressor I'm, I'm working on. Okay. So if you guys look here, none of these op amps have the power pins, okay? And as you can see, it really doesn't interfere. I don't have power pins coming off the top that I have to then put supply symbols, okay? It really keeps the design clean, and we can see how the, how the logic and how the design flows from point A to point B. If we look on the second sheet, here I have all my power pins with my bypass caps, okay? So by keeping them in a separate location, I maintain the clarity of the design here. Now, obviously, clarity is a very subjective thing, but I feel that it's clearer for me. And apparently, a lot of the old school guys felt that that, that was a better approach. OK, if you guys want to find out more about what this is, check out our YouTube channel. That contains the webinar we did on, on the compressor and using PCB SIM. Okay, let's check some questions that we have. Okay, so one question is, can the power pins be left off the schematic altogether? The answer to that question strictly is yes. They can be left off, however, I highly discourage it, because if you don't include them in the schematic, what you're allowing to happen is you're allowing Eagle to do an implicit connection, okay? So basically the power pins will connect together to any other item that has the name plus V or minus V. I don't like trusting an implicit connection. If it's not visible, if it's something that's implicit to the schematic that somebody reading would have to know that that's something Eagle can do, I don't want to rely on that. I think that hurts clarity. So the straight answer is yes, they can be left off, but I wouldn't. Um, I would actually always show them explicitly and connect them to whatever power rails they explicitly need to connect to. Okay, that just keeps the design clear. Um, with the free version of Eagle, you can have a second sheet, so there's no issues there. Okay, Constantine, yes, that's true. You can right-click and show previous used UOPs. Let me illustrate that for other users that may not be aware of it. 
and right click here and you can see all the UOPs that have been used recently. That's a little trick to speed time. Constantine brought it up in the chat, so I decided to show it to you guys as well. Thank you, Constantine. We have a question here as well. If you want the power pins in the schematic to appear as an up arrow and a down arrow, how would you do this? Okay. So what you would do is, if you look here, the power pins are just straight lines, but the supply symbol can be another shape. So for example, if I go to the add command here, and I go to the supply symbol libraries, which are supply one and supply two, you're going to notice that there are arrow supply symbols. So for example, there's these for different power rails, okay? You can reuse this, the, the, the shape of it. There's actually a UOP for creating these automatically. So you can use whatever supply symbol shape you want. And you can see here B plus, B minus. You can use those arrows. Okay. Oh, how to draw the borders with the dotted lines. Okay. The way you do that is basically use a line command, okay? And you just change the style to be long dash, short dash, or dash and dot. Okay, that's all I did. If you notice these, if I do an info on these, you'll see these are set up as long dash lines. Okay? That's basically all there is to it. Okay. Uh I think there's another question. Place correct. It does populate to the schematic. I think what it'll do is it'll force that one to go first, and then the other ones will go in. So whichever one is set to always, that one will go in first. Okay. Any other questions, guys, on these? That's basically all for this webinar. That's all we needed to cover um, for the multigated component, how to use it. Okay, if you guys have any other questions, please feel free to send them into the chat now. Oh. Henrik Jacobson, your feedback is going to V plus on your virtual ground. Okay, let me see this here. Let me see Henrik's. Uh, on BCC over 2, it is a virtual ground on sheet 2. Let me check that out. Sheet 2 right here. Yeah, it's just a, it's just a unity buffer. That's basically to make sure that that virtual ground on sheet two here is solid. Because if I just take the virtual ground from the resistors here, any amount of current is you know being drawn from that point is gonna pull the voltage up and down, which is not what we want. So by making this basically a unity buffer on this op amp, then we're gonna be okay. We're gonna be able to to, to have this virtual ground which is just four point five volts, that's all it is. Um and you can see here that this volt, this op amp is powered by the full rail. So it's okay. I'm basically having the output of this op amp be the midpoint of the rail. Henrik Jacobson, shouldn't it go? No, no. Here's what happens with that, Henrik. Basically, in, in th what this circuit does, this is a, a compressor pedal. And the idea here is that it's only running uh, on a positive uh, we're, we're not doing bipolar supplies on this. We're doing single, single-sided single supply. So we have ground and we have a positive voltage rail. Now because the signals that are going to come in are are basically uh, going to be able to go above and below, the rest of the circuit basically biases everything to this VCC over 2, creating a virtual ground. And the virtual ground is basically just kind of a trick to allow the signal to go above and below it. It's it's how you can handle bipolar signals on single-sided supplies. It's just a, a little trick to it. So it shouldn't go to the V minus because that would basically pull it straight to ground. 
which is to, to real ground, but I want this to be a virtual ground so that the signals flowing through the circuit can be centered around this point. Okay, the last thing I want to show you guys is where our YouTube channel is. We're posting all of these to YouTube, so they are going to be available. Oh, nah, that's what he's talking about. Okay. <laughs> yes, you are correct. Man, I am so glad you guys saw that. That would have driven me nuts later on. Thank you. Thank you, Samuel. I think that's what, uh, I think that's what, uh, who else had asked me? Negative feedback. Yeah, there we go. Brain fart. Thank you, guys. Thank you for, for catching that. All right, let me go ahead and fix that. Now that you guys brought it up, let me go ahead and fix that. You know what's interesting? The simulator never never bonked on that. It never it was never bothered by that. Let me go ahead and fix this. Woo! That would have driven me bonkers. Wow. Uh, ba -ba -ba -ba. Let me just go ahead and delete these real quick here. By clicking my, my center scroll wheel, I can get it to, to mirror properly. Woo! Man, that would have driven me up the wall. Thank you so much, guys. You have no idea what you have saved me. All right, good. Thanks, Sam, and thank you. Who was the other person that pointed that out? Is it just Sam? Uh, let me check the chat. Oh, and Henrik. And Henrik, Jacob. Thanks, Sam, and thank Henrik. I finally caught your point. Thank you, guys. <laughs> Sorry about that. What is the difference between power and sub-pin declaration? Okay. The supply pins are only used for supply symbols. They're not associated with any packages ever. Power pins are always associated to a package, and they basically are the incoming power for the circuit. So they can be ground, they can be the positive voltage rail, they can be all of that stuff. Okay? Hopefully that answers the, the question for Constantine. Okay? Any other questions, guys? Thank you for catching that, uh, that inversion there. Ooh, that would have driven me nuts. I, I'm going to be building that this week. Thank you so much, guys. Let me make sure there's nothing else like that going on here. Okay, here. All right. Woo. All right. Thanks, everyone. Any other questions? Anything else I can do for you guys today? Oh, i got to show you the YouTube. Here's our YouTube page. Okay. It's a uh, Eagle CAD soft computer. Here's uh, the full link. I'll go ahead and send it to you guys now through the chat in case anybody needs it. We're posting all of our webinars to here now. So feel free to, to check them out here, including that recent pedal compressor one that has the error that you guys just got now. So thank you. Okay, all of the episodes for first flights as well as all of the episodes for our advanced series are available here as well. I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing. Okay, so thank you guys for your time today. Let me know if there's anything else I can do for you. If you guys have any questions, feel free to contact us, support at cadsoftusa.com. Okay, thank you everyone for joining us. Have a great day, everyone.